Vast amounts of water found on Mars, but there's a catch. The Milky Way and Andromeda might not merge after all. A planet found before it gets destroyed and an easier way to terraform Mars. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Water is one of the biggest priorities on our exploration of Mars. If you have water, you have the potential conditions for life. And that's interesting. But also, when people are going to want to live permanently or have a research station on Mars, they're going to be able to have access to water, you can break it up, use it for oxygen and hydrogen, you can use it for propellant, you can drink it. So water is really the key to a sustainable existence on Mars. And so a lot of people are searching both for past and current evidence of water on Mars. And now it looks like scientists have found vast amounts of water on Mars, but there is a problem. And that is because it is many kilometers below the surface of the planet. So the discovery was made using the Mars InSight mission. And this was that seismic lander that was sent to Mars uh, and ceased its operations about a year ago. And it was detecting Mars quakes, it was detecting how various tremors were happening inside Mars and how they propagated out to the surface of the planet. And here on Earth, Geologists use these seismic waves to map out the interior of planet Earth. It's how we know that the Earth has a liquid molten iron core, that it has various levels inside the planet. And so researchers were able to map out various large regions inside Mars. And what they found is that there is this layer that probably has liquid water inside Mars. But it's between 11.5 kilometers and 20 kilometers deep below the surface of Mars. And like, I'm sure that sounds tantalizingly close, but it's really tricky. The deepest borehole that anyone has ever dug here on Earth is just over 12 kilometers. And so since this water layer might start at 11.5 kilometers, like it would just reach it. Imagine like the best of science trying to dig here on Earth, it's only gotten down to 12 kilometers, trying to set up that kind of an operation on Mars sounds tricky. It's not sure if the water on Mars is ice or melted. But if you did melt it and bring it to the surface, if you could dig down 11.5 kilometers and spread it out onto the surface, it would cover Mars one to two kilometers deep. So there's a lot of water. But more interesting, if we could sample it, maybe there could be the presence of life or the various byproducts of life in that water. And so it's pretty exciting that it's there. A huge lake on Mars in the past. Now sometimes objects are hiding in plain sight, even though we've got orbiters going around Mars, we've got rovers crawling on the surface, a gigantic lake remained unnoticed for all this time. So researchers were using pictures from the European Space Agency's Mars Express, they were mapping out this jumbled up region on Mars called the Corallus chaos, and it has a lot of really interesting features, there's you know, craters, obviously, but there's also the sort of lowland areas. And they realized that this jumbled up terrain, low lying areas were once part of a much larger lake system on Mars. And the really compelling evidence was they were able to detect the presence of various chemicals, salts that were left behind at the bottom of this lake bed, the kind of thing you would expect if a long time ago, there was water, and then it evaporated and left behind all of these sediments. So if you add up the total land area of this lake and consider the depth, it could fill up the Caspian Sea three times. As so researchers think that the water was there between 4.1 and 3.5 billion years ago. And then when Mars lost its magnetosphere, it could no longer hold on to its water protected it from the solar wind. And so it was all lost into space. But Mars might have what we need for terraforming. So we've, we've talked about all this water and how this water was tragically lost when Mars lost its magnetosphere and the solar wind buffeted away into space, or maybe it sequestered it many kilometers down below. But the point is there's no water on the surface of Mars. And a big problem is that it's just too cold. There's no thick atmosphere. And so many people have many ideas on how we could fix Mars, how could we terraform Mars. And like I know a bunch of you are like, we can't fix Earth, why should we bother fixing Mars? Fine. Just spitballing ideas here. We're just brainstorming. 
No one's actually going to do any of this stuff. But one of the big ideas is that you would release chlorofluorocarbons into the atmosphere of Mars. And these are a very potent greenhouse gas. They would absorb sunlight and release the heat into the area. It would warm up the temperature of the planet. You'd reach a certain point where then the polar ice caps would melt and that would continue to thicken the atmosphere. And you would get to this point where you could walk around on the surface of Mars without needing a spacesuit, you would still need like air to breathe, but you could be reasonably comfortable on the surface of Mars at the equator. And so that's really exciting. Now the problem is that you would need so much chlorofluorocarbons to be brought from Earth to Mars, you need tanker after tanker after tanker. And so what if there was a way to use something that's readily available on the surface of Mars. And so researchers looked at the kinds of things that are there. And one of the possibilities is that you can use aluminum and iron, which is present in the rocks, and you can make nanoparticles that do the same job as chlorofluorocarbons, you would manufacture tiny little structures, nanotubes, varying sizes, different shapes, and then release them into the atmosphere on Mars. And then they would absorb energy, they would release it into the atmosphere on Mars, they would warm up the temperature of the planet, you'd get those carbon dioxide, polar ice caps, sublimating, maybe the water would start to melt and would warm up the temperature of the planet. And so what's interesting is you could just do this locally, they calculated that if you could release 30 liters of these nanoparticles into the atmosphere of Mars, every second, then that would be enough to begin that process of raising the temperature and melting the ice caps and moving towards a partly terraformed Mars. And so this idea is about 5000 times more efficient than other techniques that have been proposed. And it's local, like you just have to set up a factory that is pumping these nanoparticles into the air on Mars, and you could start terraforming it. Now, the big problem, of course, is that the solar wind is continuing to buffet Mars. And so if any thickening of the atmosphere that you create any water that you release is just going to go through that same process, it's going to, but it'll be very slow, it'll take a long time for the solar wind, like it took it billions of years to remove the atmosphere. But the other idea that I really like, is that you can take now we're sort of shifting into the QA. But anyway, um, like people always say, yeah, but the solar wind is going to remove the water on Mars. So why bother? Well, it's gonna take a long time if you're actually able to get this process started. But also, if you put a giant solar sail at the Mars Sun L1 Lagrange point, you can actually block the solar wind so that it sort of goes around Mars. And then you're no longer losing this atmosphere. And in fact, volcanic gases on Mars would start to build up and also helps to thicken the atmosphere. So obviously, this is all science fiction. You know, it's like, who would win in a fight Superman or the Hulk? Right? But it's fun to think about Viper might fly to the moon after all. So we reported last couple of weeks that NASA has decided to cancel its Viper mission to the moon. This is a really cool rover that was going to assist in the search for volatiles on the surface of the moon. They have built the rover. They have booked the flight to the moon, but they have canceled the mission. And so instead of sending the rover that is built, they're going to send a mass of this equivalent to the moon just to make sure that they sort of fulfill on a payload to the moon. Now, obviously, this sounds a little crazy. But when you have no more budget, these are the kinds of solutions that you have to come up with. So NASA has been shopping around to see if they can find a commercial partner that will help get this mission going again, they're looking for someone who can help cover some of the ongoing maintenance costs of the rover on the lunar surface. And in a way that doesn't accrue any budget to the government to be able to do that portion of it, if they can do that, then maybe the mission can fly again. I often hear people say, well, you know, like, why is NASA canceling this mission? Why don't they find a commercial partner who will take over someone who can take over the International Space Station or the Chandra X ray? Well, okay, let's find out if they can do it. Let's see if somebody wants a built rover with a flight to the moon, that's going to cost several million dollars a year in maintenance to run. Will anyone step forward? We're gonna find out. So the rumor mill says that maybe intuitive machines will be the one to buy this and they've got some potential investors who are going to kick in some money as well. So so Viper might be saved milk dromeda cancelled. Now we talk about how Andromeda is heading directly towards the Milky Way. And at some point in many billions of years, the Milky Way and Andromeda will merge into this much larger elliptical galaxy 
which I call Milk Dramata, but maybe it's not going to happen. It's not 100% certain. According to researchers, it's probably only 50% chance of it happening. And that's because the Milky Way and Andromeda aren't completely alone in the local group. There's actually about 100 dwarf galaxies, as well as Andromeda, the Milky Way and another very large galaxy M33 in Triangulum. And when you consider the gravity of M33, you consider the gravity of fairly large dwarf galaxies like the large Magellanic cloud, then they can cause three body interactions that may make Milky Way and Andromeda miss each other, and maybe even spin one of them away from the local group entirely. So maybe they won't be merging in the next few billion years, they'll sort of spin around each other, take a much longer route to finally find each other and merge much longer in the future. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best week's space news. And the winner this week was the discovery of graphene on the moon. So thank you everybody who voted. Now we post a new poll into our community tab here on YouTube within about 24 hours of when we release Space Bites. So if you're watching this, we might have already posted the vote. But the best way to see it is to subscribe to the channel, click on the notifications bell, and then watch a bunch of our videos. And that'll train the algorithm that you want to see our vote whenever we post a new one. A planet found just before its destruction. Well, this was convenient. Astronomers found a planet just moments before it was going to be torn up into pieces and destroyed by its star. Okay, astronomically speaking, uh, it's not going to happen in moments, it's gonna happen in hundreds of millions of years. But still, whew, this was close. So the planet is designated TOI 6255. That's one of the TESS objects of interest. And it's about an Earth sized planet, but it takes only 5.7 hours to go around its star. So that's really quick. It is not a habitable planet. It is like a hot Jupiter, but Earth sized going around its planet. And because it's so close to its star, it is in this process where it is spiraling closer and closer. Think of Phobos spiraling into Mars that it's going to crash into Mars in 50 to 200 million years from now. It's the same process and so it's just getting closer and closer and closer. And they estimate that within about 400 million years, this planet will cross the Roche limit. This is where the force of gravity on the front of the planet is so strong compared to the force of gravity on the back side of the planet, it can no longer hold itself together as a single object. And it will just be torn into this spray of debris, and then all of that will be consumed by the star, but it's already started to feel the effect it is not shaped like a sphere. It is more like a football. Well, rugby ball. I don't want to confuse the European people. So we've got a planner time accordingly, we've only got 400 million years to continue observing before it's gone. A new way to detect binary supermassive black holes. Now, thanks to LIGO and other gravitational wave observatories, we have watched the signal coming from stellar mass black holes crashing into each other. But those telescopes are not capable of detecting the much larger supermassive black holes as they merge. And yet, thanks to the pulsar timing array, we know this process is happening out there in the universe, we just can't detect them directly. So researchers are proposing that we could use the mergers between stellar mass black holes as a probe to detect the presence of much larger supermassive black holes that are in binary pairs that essentially the signal coming from the stellar mass black holes as they merge will be distorted by the gravitational well of nearby supermassive black holes. And if you have two black holes that are orbiting around each other, you'll get even more distinct distortion of this signal. So <laughs> It's crazy, right? We could use some of the most extreme objects in the universe crashing into each other as a way to detect the presence of even more extreme versions of those objects in the universe. Vera Rubin gets its secondary mirror. We continue to give you play by play updates on the construction and completion of the Vera Rubin Observatory. This is the telescope that I am most looking forward to. It's designed to come online first light in 2025. And we learned this month that they have installed the secondary mirror of the telescope. So we think about the Vera Rubin, it is this 8.4 meter telescope. 
and then it has a 3.5 meter secondary mirror that's positioned above. The light comes down through the aperture of the telescope, bounces off the primary mirror, goes up to the secondary mirror, bounces off the secondary mirror, and then reflects off the primary mirror again, which they also call the tertiary mirror. And then it's channeled into the biggest camera ever built. The key is that this will be an incredibly fast telescope that will allow it to observe the entire southern hemisphere night sky every couple of days. And so we'll get a sense of every interesting thing that is happening to the universe when we weren't looking. It'll discover millions of supernovae. It'll find so many more of the asteroids moving in the solar system. It'll be the machine that'll find planet nine. And we are just a couple of months away. So I can't wait for Vera Rubin. If you want more space news, I write a weekly email newsletter that goes out to 70,000 people. There's no ads in it. I write every word and you can sign up for free, unsubscribe anytime. And just to give you an example of some of the stories that we have in this week's newsletter, a hopper that could explore over 150 kilometers of Triton surface in two years. What time is it on the moon? Lunar GPS needs to know. And NASA says goodbye to its asteroid hunting Neowise mission. So if you want to subscribe to this newsletter, go to universetoday.com slash newsletter. Now I'm going to give you an update on what's happening with our weekly live streams and question shows. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Robach, Spiderswap.io, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Filer Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. So once again, I'm going to talk about some of the internal operations here of this channel and universe today. And so if that's not interesting to you, if you're not a fan of the channel, no problem. Now would be a good time to go and watch some other video. But for those of you who are looking forward to the live streams, here's the story. So of course, we're on our summer hiatus right now for doing live streams, but we will be back in early September. So we're going to start on September 2nd at 5pm Pacific time. And we'll do the live stream the way we always do. Uh, so we'll start at five o'clock, we'll do the first hour that'll be recorded for the QA and then we'll do another hour and that'll be overtime. So when we return in September back to doing the full live streams, we post a bunch of material after we finish the live stream and we release the new QA onto Patreon. So we release the actual edited QA, but then we also release a link to the full unedited live stream. And so if you're subscribed to us on Patreon for free, you will get that link and you can watch it the week after we actually did the show live. We also release a full edited audio version of that to the patrons. And so if you become a patron, you can get that showing up automatically on your podcatching app. But between now and the end of the month, we will also be doing one more of our patron only question show. This is where I ask the patrons to send in questions. And then my producer Anton and I get together and we answer those questions and talk about behind the scenes stuff at Universe Today. And I'm going to send out the call for questions, probably within about a week for now. So if you want to be part of that, you want to be able to have your question answered and I get to most of them. So it's a good chance if you've got like a question you really want answered, this is the way to do it. And so you can go to patreon.com slash universe today and you'll see sort of everything that we're gearing up for the return of the fall season. All right, we'll see you next week.